Hi there, my valued, highly treasured, and esteemed viewers and listeners, and welcome back to your channel of choice. My name is Dr. Nath Arwa. I am a clinical pharmacist by training and by profession, and I am the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, a premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference we are patient safety, medication therapy management, and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here, we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services, so I humbly urge you to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you some precious tips which may prove useful in your line of duty. So I welcome you to part 58 of our pharmacotherapy MCQ series, Majoring in Pulmonology. Our first question reads, Mr. PWW, a 26-year-old male patient, is admitted at your hospital following an acute asthma exacerbation. Three days prior to this admission, he had completed an oral cause of prednisone for a prior asthma exacerbation. Despite these recent events, he wasn't compliant with his prescribed inhaler corticosteroids and has already consumed three cans of salbutamol MDI this month. So my question to you is, which of the following represents risk factors for asthma related to mortality in the accident and emergency department? Is it the excessive use of short-acting bitter agonists, what we abbreviate as SABA, or is it hospital admission for asthma in the past year, or is it poor adherence to prescribed asthma regimen or is it recently stopped taking corticosteroids i'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer so for the first time all the four answers are correct there are features of asthma exacerbation and asthma disease progression that can increase a patient's risk of asthma-related mortality in the accident and emergency department. Now, our patient in this particular case has numerous risk factors that increase uh, his risk of asthma-related mortality or death. Now, patients who have been hospitalized or presented to an accident and emergency department for asthma-related complications within the past year are at an increased risk of asthma-related death. And uh, since recent oral corticosteroid use is a marker of disease severity and uh, recent exacerbation or current or recent use is a risk, factor for asthma related death. Um, patients who use their SABA excessively or as their only agent despite being in a higher GINA step are at a risk of asthma related death as well. So our patient here is a culprit. I would also like to add that patients who aren't compliant with their prescribed asthma regimens, which are supposed to be an HD, an ICS, plus a LABA, plus an add-on therapy for a patient like our case here, are also at a risk of asthma-related death. Then I would like to add that factors that increase asthma-related death should be identified and modified where feasible or possible. Then uh, common risk factors may include history of near fetal asthma, recent hospitalization, or steroid use, even lack of an inhaled corticosteroid use in the patient's regimen can be a factor, or 
poor compliance with the regimen can also be a factor and there are even a history of psychiatric disease or psychosocial problems can contribute. Such patients may not comply or adhere to their treatment regimens well. I would like to emphasize that written asthma action plans can improve patient-oriented outcomes in the management of asthma. Now, each patient should have and also understand the individualized action plans for them to own their asthma treatment and for clinical outcomes that are, can be classified as optimal. Let's move to the next slide, please. And the question reads, Mr. P.O.B., a 57-year-old male patient, presents to your hospital with a past medical history of COPD, half ref heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, dyslipidemia, and hypertension. He is adherent on Symbicot, Cabedilol, Atovastatin, Isinopril, Amlodipine, and furosemide. Now, if you are conducting a thorough medication reconciliation and a clinical check for Mr. P O B, which of the following would be an appropriate follow-up comment regarding Mr. P O B's therapy? Would it be as inhibitors aren't appropriate to use in patients with COPD due to cough potential? Or would it be non-selective beta blockers are the most appropriate to use in patients with COPD and half ref? Or would it be beta blockers improve survival in heart failure and selective beta blockers should be used? Or would it be D, S inhibitors improve survival in heart failure and protect the lungs from further damage? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So C is the correct answer. Beta blockers improve survival in heart failure and selective beta blockers should therefore be used. Now there is no evidence suggesting that congestive heart failure should be treated differently in patients with COPD. Although cavedilol, metoprolol, succinate and bisoprolol have survival benefit, beta-1 selective agents should be used when possible. And uh, while there is no evidence against using non-selective beta blockers in patients with COPD and with half ref, it is preferred to use beta-1 selective agents. Now, I would like to add that S inhibitors improve survival in heart failure, but the potential cough doesn't carry a recommendation for avoiding them in COPD. And uh, there is no concrete data to support respiratory protection provided by this agent. So I would not opt for D. All those statements make C our best alternative in this particular question. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, considering patients with known hyperactive airway disease, in brackets asthma, which of the following reflects a positive bronchodilatory response when a short-acting bronchodilator should be prescribed to the patient? Is it an increase in post-bronchodilatory FEV1 of at least 50 ml compared to baseline? Or is it an increase in post-bronchodilator FEV1 of at least 100 ml compared to baseline? Or is it an increase in post bronchodilator FEV1 of at least 12% compared to baseline, or is it D, an increase in post bronchodilator FEV1 of at least 5% compared to baseline? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So 
So C is the correct answer. An increase in post bronco directory FEV1 of at least 12% compared to baseline. Now, a positive response of or to uh, short acting bronchodilators is defined in literature as a 12% or a 200 ml increase in the first expiratory volume at one second, abbreviated as FEV1, or first vital capacity, abbreviated as FVC, from baseline values when doing spirometry. Now, spirometry before and after bronchodilatory therapy is done to determine the degree of bronchodilation achieved when standard doses of subbus, short-acting bronchodilators, uh, are administered as defined by the American Thoracic Society. Now, patients with COPD rarely achieve a positive bronchodilatory response as defined above due to the irreversibly damaged airway or, or uh, due to their irreversible airway remodeling that leads to obstruction of or to airflow. Now, regardless of this, uh, short-acting bronchodilators are still utilized in the management of COPD to reduce the symptoms as much as possible though we know that the remodeling does a lot of damage and the response to bronchodilators may not be substantial let's move to the next question please and it reads which of the statements below best describes the mechanism of action of theophylline is theophylline a 5 lipoxygenase inhibitor is it the inhibition of leukotriene receptors? Is it the inhibition of phosphodiesterase, thereby causing bronchodilation? Or is it bronchodilation via activation of the beta-2 receptor? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So C is the correct answer. It is inhibition of phosphodiesterase, thereby causing bronchodilation. Now, when theophylline inhibits phosphodiesterase, it increases the intracellular cyclic AMP in a number of tissues, for example, in the heart and in the airway. Now, this results in bronchodilation of the airway, and uh, at the heart level, it may cause an increase in heart rate and uh, I would like to remind you that if too much theophylline is administered to a, a patient, uh, such patients can experience tachycardia, arrhythmias, insomnia, and even seizures. So be very, very careful when using theophylline in therapy of asthmatics. I would like to add that uh, bronchodilation applies to uh, drugs such as salbutamol so answer D would apply to salbutamol not to theophylline then I would like to remind you that uh, answer B refers to agents such as Montelukas which is marketed as Singulair or Zafilukas which is marketed as Acolyte those are the examples of leukotriene receptor blockers or inhibitors now, answer A refers to a drug like Zilutron, the marketed as Zyflu, which is the de facto inhibitor of 5 lipooxygenase. Theophylline does not work by that uh, mechanism. So, all those statements make alternative C the correct answer in this particular case. Let's move to the next question. Which reads, which of the medications listed below is marketed as a reconstituted solution for inhalation and is administered via 
inhalation for the treatment of uh, pseudomonas aeruginosa in patients with cystic fibrosis. Zito Rita Vansin, Azturnum, marked it as Keystone, Tyotropium, marked it as Spiriva, or Aclidinium. I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So B is our correct option in this particular case. As Turnum, marketed as K-stone, is the formulation for nebulization, which is indicated for the treatment of cystic fibrosis due to its coverage against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now alternative A, Orita Vansin, marketed as Orbactive, is a parenteral glycopeptide that is administered IV for, if I remember well, skin, acute bacterial skin and soft tissue infections. And it is not available for oral nebulization at all, at all. Now, Spiriva thyotropium is a long-acting anticholinergic bronchodilator used for the maintenance, not acute treatment of asthma and COPD. It is not used for cystic fibrosis management at all. Now, aclidinium is a, a long-acting anticholinergic bronchodilator that is used in the maintenance and not acute treatment of asthma and COPD. It is not used in the management of cystic fibrosis at all. So all those statements make alternative B our correct choice. Let's move to the next question, please. Which reads, which of the statements below is or are accurate with regard to level salbutamol? Is it true that it is the R isomer of salbutamol? Is it true that it is the S isomer of salbutamol? Is it true that it has been demonstrated in all published studies cause less side effects than salbutamol or is it true that it binds to the M3 receptor with greater affinity or is it true that it does its dose sorry is roughly half the dose of salbutamol I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer So answers A and E are the correct options in this particular case. Salbutamol, as we know it, is a racemic mixture containing both R, salbutamol, and S, salbutamol isomers. Now since level salbutamol contains only the R isomer, which is half of the molecules found in the regular racemic salbutamol, the dose is half. Now this is true of most medications where the active isomer is isolated from the racemic mixture of drugs. Now the M3 receptor is a miscarinic receptor that is antagonized by drugs such as thiotropium spiriva. And uh, uh, levosalbutamol here binds to and activates the beta 2 receptor which has nothing to do with the M3 receptor at all. Now the S isomer of salbutamol has no bronchodilatory activity at all. And I uh, would also like to add that there have not been any head-to-head -head clinical trials with salbutamol to show that level salbutamol causes less side effects. So I would not uh, make that conclusion in alternative C. And all those statements make answers A and E, the correct options in this particular question. Let's move to the next question, please. 
Our next question reads, which of the medications listed below used in the management of pulmonary arterial hypertension PAH is available as an IV infusion? Is it apoprostenol marketed as Flolan? Is it Riosiguat marketed as Adempas? Is it Macitentan marketed as Opsumit? Or is it Ambricentan? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So our correct answer is apoprostenol, Flolan. Now this particular product is a prostaglandin vasodilator and it is available as an IV infusion which should be administered through a CVC. It has a very short half-life of six minutes and that's what makes administration via infusion and not bolus. Now alternative B Riosiguat or Adempas is an oral soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator that is available as a tablet. So it is the wrong answer in this particular case. And Ambricentan is an oral endothelin receptor antagonist used in the treatment of PAH that is also available in tablet form so that makes it the wrong option then massicentan sorry massitentan is an oral endothelin receptor antagonist that is also available as a tablet so that makes it wrong as well and i would just like to remind you that apoprostenol flolan is most commonly used for group one pulmonary hypertension and it causes direct vasodilation of pulmonary and systemic arteriovascular beds. And uh, it also inhibits platelet aggregation that makes it very useful in this cohort of patients. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mrs. MMK. 66 year old female newly diagnosed with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease whose spirometry reveals a pre bronchodilatory FEV1 of 70% predicted value. Uh, she informs your chest physician that she becomes short of breath easily and often lags behind others because she needs. To from time to time stop to in her words catch her breath today her C80 score is 12 and uh, she experienced an exacerbation 90 days ago three months ago and was treated as an outpatient so my question to you is which of the following is the most appropriate grade classification for mrs. M M K according to the gold guidelines is it a gold four two one or three i'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer So I would classify her gold 2. Now MMK is considered gold 2 based on her FEV1 which falls in the range of 50 to 79 of the predicted value. Now according to guidance gold 1 is considered an FEV of 80% predicted or higher. Gold 3, on the other hand, is considered FEV1 of 30 to 49% of the predicted. Gold 4 is considered FEV of below 30% predicted. Now, gold categories 1, 
through four, provide information regarding severity of airflow limitation in these patients. Now the gold guidelines use a multi-step assessment to approach uh, the evaluation of patients with COPD. And I would like to add that airflow limitation which applies to the gold grid and clinical parameters which applies to the gold group are now separated which will help to facilitate a more accurate treatment recommendation based on uh, the patient specific parameters and symptoms so it will make things easier for the chest physicians moving forward let's move to the next slide please the question reads, your chest physician is considering initiating a patient suffering from COPD who now has a chronic hypoxia induced pulmonary hypertension on mercitentan. My question to you is which of the following is the most important to evaluate at baseline before using mercitentan long term in this particular patient? Is it serum creatinine? fasting blood glucose, liver enzymes, or the patient's body weight. I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. To settle for the liver enzymes. Now we know that Marcitentan Opsumit is an oral endothelin receptor antagonist that is used in the management or treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now we know that the endothelin receptor antagonist can cause hepatotoxicity and even liver failure in extreme cases. Therefore, uh, baseline liver enzymes should be measured at baseline in a patient whom we intend to initiate on mercitentan. Our proper management of patients with PAH taking mercitentan uh, should have monitoring of their liver enzymes due to the risk of hepatotoxicity. We need to do that monitoring to avoid complications. Now in patients with PAH ET1 levels are increased tenfold and uh, these values correlate with an increase in the mean right arterial pressure and the disease severity. Now the receptor subtype ETA causes vasoconstriction and uh, cell proliferation while the ETB causes vasodilation, anti-proliferation, and even ET1 clearance. That's just a by the way. Let's move to the next slide, please. And the question reads, Mr. JJM, a 57-year-old male patient presents to your chest clinic with a chief complaint of chest tightness and productive cough, which he informs your chest physician worsens in the evening and he experiences intermittent wheezing when exposed to outside allergens. So when the chest physician performs spirometry, the FEV1 to FCV ratio is uh, computed as 78% and uh, there is moderate improvement after administration of salbutamol. So my question to you is, what is Mr. JJM's most likely diagnosis? Is this a case of COPD, asthma, pulmonary fibrosis, or obstructive sleep apnea? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So this gentleman is asthmatic. A diagnosis of asthma 
is the most likely when patients present with more than one of the following symptoms wheezing shortness of breath cough chest tightness and even if symptoms worsen at night or symptoms vary over time and are triggered by various stimuli such as injections exercise allergens or even laughter and so on and so forth now alternative c pulmonary fibrosis typically presents with shortness of breath and a dry cough now such patients are always fatigued and they have unexplained weight loss clubbing muscle and joint aches so unfortunately those symptoms were not mentioned in a patient's case so i would settle for asthma as the condition in this particular patient's case so my highly esteemed viewers and listeners that brings us to the end of this video if you have benefited from this video in any way please remember to give it a thumbs up and to like it and to share it widely with your peers and if you haven't yet done so I humbly urge you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I would like to promise you that the best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video and for listening to me. I sincerely appreciate your partnership and your continued support and kind collaboration. I look forward to interacting with you in part 59 of our pharmacotherapy MCQ series. Thank you very much.